Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Then Al-Hafidh Rahimahullah said Bab al The chapter of stealing This chapter deals with the had punishment of stealing But as for stealing itself Then the ruling on this is that it is haram It is taking other people's wealth without due right Allah Jalla wa'ala says وَلَا تَأْكُلُوا أَمْوَالَكُمْ بَيْنَكُمْ بِالْبَاطِلِ Do not take each other's wealth through unlawful means and this includes all types of unlawful means, including stealing. Likewise, in the authentic hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, لا يسرق السارق حين يسرق وهو مؤمن That the robber does not rob when he is robbing, and he is a believer at the same time. So at the time when he is stealing, he does not have full level of iman. So his iman is the minimum it can be at that particular time. And the Prophet said the same thing about the one who drinks the khamr and about the one who commits a zina. That at the time of doing this action, they are not a mu'min. Meaning to say that their iman is not the complete form of iman. It is deficient. It is just enough to keep them in Islam. But that's about it. Likewise, the Prophet ﷺ told us that your wealth is haram. Just like your blood and just like your honor. So it has this sanctity about it and it must not be violated. And of course we have the ijma' of the scholars that a sariqa or stealing is haram. However, not all types of stealing incurs the had punishment, which is the cutting off of the hand. The type of sariqa which has the had punishment is defined as follows. Taking wealth in a clandestine fashion from the owner of the wealth or the owner's deputy. So when we say wealth, we mean that which the Sharia deems as wealth. So is khamar, for example, wealth? The answer is no, because you cannot buy and sell khamar. It is haram. Or for example, musical instruments or anything which is haram in this way is not considered wealth. So if somebody was to steal this, then he would not have his hand cut off. We said in a clandestine fashion. So this opposes if somebody takes somebody else's wealth openly. So if somebody takes somebody else's wealth and you can see him do it and the owner can even see himself getting robbed, then this is not the type of stealing which has the had punishment. And we also say that it has to be from the owner of the wealth or his deputy. When we say deputy, we mean that the person does not own this wealth. However, he is in possession of this wealth through the permission of the original owner. So which types of people does this not involve? Well, this does not involve a robber, or it does not involve the one who usurps this wealth. For example, if person A usurps some wealth from person B, then person C comes along and steals this wealth from person A. Is the hand of person C cut off? The answer is no, because he did not steal it from the owner. Or for example, if person A steals person B's wealth, and then person C steals from person A. Is person C's hand cut off? The answer is no, because he did not steal it from the owner. He stole it from a person who had previously stolen this item. So notice here that the wealth which is being stolen needs to have hurma, which is sanctity. So for example, if you steal khamr, then this does not have the sanctity. Therefore, the had is not incurred. And also, the person you're stealing from needs to have sanctity. So this would be the owner or his deputy. It would not be the one who has stolen this wealth, nor would it be the one who has usurped this wealth. So this is the definition of the sariqa or the stealing, which incurs the had. Of course, it is different to sariqa in the language because sariqa in the language or stealing in the language is wider in scope. So not all types of stealing in the language incurs the had punishment. This is the issue. However, for the had punishment of stealing to be established, conditions must be met. The first condition is that the one who is doing the stealing must be eligible for the had punishment, which basically means that he must be baligh, aqil, alim, and muldazim. And this is the condition for all types of people who commit a crime or a sin in which the had punishment is involved, they must meet this criteria. And they must be either Muslim or a dhimmi living in an Islamic state, because the had punishment can only be established in an Islamic state. The second condition is 
about the one who is being stolen from, so he must be the owner or the deputy, and this is part of the definition which we have said, but it is also one of the conditions. And then we have a condition pertaining to the way in which it is stolen. It must be stolen in a clandestine fashion, so it must not be done openly. And then the fourth condition, that this wealth must be put in a well-guarded place. So if it is out in the open and somebody steals from it, then this is not the type of sadaqah which incurs the had punishment. It needs to be put in a place in which customarily it is deemed to be a private and protective place. Fifthly, the wealth must be something which has sanctity, and we spoke about that as well in the definition. And sixthly, this wealth must reach the minimum nisab level, which is a quarter of a dinar, and we'll talk about this hadith which is coming up. But the point is that if somebody steals wealth which is equivalent in value to less than a quarter of a dinar, then there is no cutting off. And seventhly, there must be no shubha or no doubtful matters concerning this stealing. Because some people may well have the right in the sharia to take from another person's wealth. For example, can the wife steal from the husband's wealth? Well, if she did take from the husband's wealth, then her hand would not be cut off because the husband has to spend on his wife by way of obligation. So if a wife takes from the husband's wealth, and all the other conditions are met, then still the hand is not cut off because this is a valid shubuha or a doubtful matter. So these are the conditions, seven of them, which must be met before the hand could be cut off. So for example, if you're walking in the street and somebody comes running up to you and snatches your purse or your wallet away and runs off, clearly this has been done in front of you and it is not done in a clandestine fashion. If this person is caught, his hand would not be cut off because the conditions are not met. Or for example, if somebody usurps your wealth, let's say you have a piece of land and he comes and forcefully takes over, then his hand is not cut off either because he did not steal this wealth in a clandestine fashion. Similarly, if you were to deposit some wealth at somebody else's house and then he does not give it back to you, then this would be stealing in the normal sense of the word, but it does not incur the had punishment because he did not do it in this clandestine fashion. The ruling is different if somebody else asks you to lend him some wealth and then he denies that you ever gave it to him. This is different and we have a narration coming up to that effect. What about a pickpocket? Well, a pickpocket does meet the criteria because your pocket is a place where you put your wealth and it is a protective place. So it is a hirz. A hirz is a place which protects your wealth. Now, a pickpocket, by definition, will take this wealth of yours secretly. He would not do it out in the open such that he could be seen. That's the whole art of pickpocketing, is that you do it such that you cannot be seen. And he certainly has taken it from a private protective place, therefore the conditions are met, and a pickpocket, his hand can be cut off. If all the other conditions are met, of course. What about if a person abducts somebody else's child? Would we say this is a type of stealing which incurs the had punishment? Well, no, because the child is not wealth in that you cannot buy and sell it. Therefore, this is not the type of sadaqah which incurs the had punishment. But what about if he abducts this child and the child is wearing some jewellery, let's say, of gold, which is worth more than a quarter of a dinar? Now is his hand eligible to be cut off? Some scholars say no, because he has taken the child, he did not take the jewellery per se. So we'll be on the safe side and not cut the hand off. Other scholars would say, if the reason why he abducted the child is because of the jewellery, then yes, we would punish him in accordance with his intention, which is to steal the jewellery. But in any case, whichever opinion you follow, the minimum which would be given to this type of person who abducts a child, who has jewellery on him, is the ta'zir punishment. And the severity of this crime may even lead them to being classified as the mufsideen, the ones who cause mischief on the earth, and in that case then they will be given the punishment for the qutta al-tariq, those who cut off the way of the people, and they frighten them or take their wealth or murder them. And the punishment for these types of people is far more severe. So perhaps the ruler thinks that you have a group of people who are abducting children, and they have generally formed this group to cause mischief, 
then they can be given a punishment which is far severer. And their punishment is mentioned in Surah Al-Ma'idah. إِنَّمَا جَزَاءُ الَّذِينَ يُحَارِبُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَسَادًا أَنْ يُقَتَّلُوا أَوْ يُصَلَّبُوا أَوْ تَقَطَّعَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ مِنْ خِلَافٍ أَوْ يُنْفَوْ مِنَ الْأَرْضِ And the chapter of this is coming up. What about if somebody steals a musical instrument? No, his hand is not cut off because this is not a piece of wealth which is sacrosanct. What about a tape recorder or a radio? Well, this is wealth which is sacrosanct. It can be bought and sold. Of course, it could be used for halal and haram, but in and of itself, it is halal. So even if you were to destroy such wealth, which is haram, so musical instruments or khamar, then you will not stand as a guarantor. In fact, we would thank you for doing this job. However, physically breaking somebody else's haram wealth is only permissible if you have the authority to do so. So it's not just any man can enter somebody else's house and break their haram wealth, whether it is idols or musical instruments or khamar or other than that. If you do not have authority over the other person, then at best you can advise them and give them admonition. If a person steals alcohol though, then it would actually depend because maybe he is stealing the container which contains the khamar. So in that case, his hand could be cut off because the container itself is not haram. As for if he wanted to steal the alcohol or the khamar, then his hand would not be cut off. As for the condition of the minimum nisab, which would make you eligible for the cutting of the hand, then we have a hadith coming up to that effect. So we'll delay the discussion till then. A vital condition for the had punishment to be established is that he has to take this wealth from a hirz which is a place in which the wealth is guarded and a private place. And the evidence for this is coming up when we discuss the ahadith. But the Prophet ﷺ said that if a person steals the fruit before they have been put into the jareen, which is a place in which the fruits are dried, and the jareen is a private place, it is a hirz. So if the stealing takes place before that, so in other words, the fruit is taken from out in the open in public, then this does not incur the cutting of the hand. Rather, the robber needs to pay back the fruit and also what he has to pay back will be doubled. So that will be his punishment, not the cutting of the hand. But then this begs the question, what is a hirz and who decides what a hirz is? Because maybe the robber could say, well, I did not steal it from a hirz, I stole it from a place which is public. And so then we could enter into an argument about what a hirz actually is. And so we say the way to decide this would be that we let the customs of the people decide what a hirz is. And this would be different in accordance with the different time, place, and also the ruler. So if the ruler is a strong ruler and he implements justice in the land, then people will freely leave things in open, safe in the knowledge that nobody would steal them because the ruler is so strong. As for if the ruler is weak, then you have to be more careful about where you leave your things. So you cannot leave them out in the open or in certain places where you would be able to leave them had the ruler been a strong ruler. Because with a weak ruler, there is less justice and there is more crime. And the hirz also could differ with regards to the item which is stolen. So for example, the hirz for gold would not be the same as the hirz for clothing. Of course, the one for gold would be much more severe. Okay, what about if somebody produces a piece of work, let's say a book, and he has a copyright on this book. So another publisher cannot publish this book. So what happens if another publisher does publish this book? He has, in effect, stolen somebody else's property, has he not? So would this incur the had punishment? The answer is, here it would not incur the had punishment, although having said that, it does not mean to say that it is permissible, because when it comes to copyright laws, then we have to follow the law of the land and it appears that every country has copyright laws which have to be respected and so you have to follow the law of the land and the customs of the people and we say that then therefore islamically it is not permissible to infringe copyright laws but as for the had punishment then no the had punishment does not apply because it is not stealing something from a properly guarded place or a hirz Although for this, the ruler can give a ta'zir. Okay, what about if we have some gold in a safe? 
which is in somebody's house. And then a robber breaks in. He takes the safe and he throws the safe outside the window. So now the safe is not in the private house. It is out in the street, which is a public place, of course. And hence it is not a hirz. And then he breaks open the safe and he then takes the gold from the safe. So is his hand cut off for this? The answer is yes, of course, the hand is cut off. And if he argues that he took it from a public place because the safe was in a public road, then this would not be accepted, of course. He is obviously trying this hila to get around stealing. Here's another issue. If it is medically possible to grow another hand after the hand of the thief is cut off, then is this permissible? The answer is no, because this defeats the whole purpose. The whole point is that he must lose this hand. However, what we can say is that it is permissible to put an anesthetic on this hand when cutting it off because the idea is not to cause pain. The idea is for him to lose his hand. And this is different to qisas, of course. So if somebody cuts off another person's hand and the victim wants qisas, then he's allowed to cut off the perpetrator's hand. In a case like this, we would not be allowed to use anesthetics because in doing so, we would remove the pain. But that's the whole point of qisas. The perpetrator must suffer the same pain which he inflicted. What about if you're a shepherd and you have some sheep and somebody comes and steals one of your sheep? What would be a hirz for the sheep? Well, some scholars have said that a hirz for the sheep would be that the sheep are in the pasturing ground and they are under the watchful eye of the shepherd. So if somebody then comes and steals one of the sheep without the shepherd being aware, then this would be a hirz. As for if the shepherd is somewhere else and he's not guarding the sheep, then this would not be a hirz. This would be more akin to a public place and not a private place. So the point is, the moment the shepherd is looking after the sheep and is with them, it becomes private place. And if he's not with them, it becomes a public place. But of course, if the shepherd is with the sheep, but he has to take a break, let's say for salah or for wudu, and during this limited period of time, one of the sheep is stolen, then this would still be classified as a hirz or as a private place, which would incur the cutting of the hand. Also, we said one of the conditions is that this wealth must not have any shubuha or any doubt about it. So let's talk about this issue. Actually, this condition of shubuha is a condition for all the hath punishments. Remember, we said that if this shubuha or this doubtful matter is strong enough or valid enough, then yes, we would avert the hath punishments. So what about this scenario? If a person steals from the wealth of his father, is this a matter of shubuha? Well, is this a shubhatul mulk? A doubtful matter concerning who owns the wealth? Well, no, it's not. Clearly, the father owns the wealth. Is this the shubha of at-tamalluk? Meaning, when you take possession and take ownership of somebody else's wealth? No, it is not because the son is not allowed to take ownership of his father's wealth. But this is a shubha of infaq. A doubtful matter concerning expenditure because it is wajib upon the father to spend on his son. And also we can add, this could be a shubha of tabassut. Tabassut means to spread yourself out or to become expansive. And what this means here, that the son would think, well, the father is not going to mind if I take some of his wealth. So it should be okay. And if you are a father and you realize that your son has stolen some of your money, would you feel the same way as if some stranger from outside came and stole some of that money, even if it was the same amount of money, or perhaps even less? The answer is you probably wouldn't. You wouldn't mind as much your son stealing from you as you would a stranger. And so in this way, the son would feel that the father would not mind if he takes some of his money, so he'll do it. So this is tabassut. The son doesn't really have a right, but because this wealth is the wealth of his father, he's just going to help himself. So these are two types of shubuhat, one of infaq and one of tabassut. Of course, it does not mean that it is halal to steal from the father. But what we are concerned with here is not the halal and haram aspect of it, but rather it is the had punishment aspect. So based upon this then, if a son steals his father's wealth from a hirz, which is a private guarded place, then we would not cut off the son's hand because of these shubuhat. 
the son can easily claim that the father needs to spend on him and this is why he took some of the money. Or perhaps it was okay for him to take his father's money because he would not mind. What about if a person steals from the wealth of his mother? Well here we cannot have a shubuha of the infaq, of the expenditure, because the mother is not obligated to spend on her children. But we could have the shubuha of the tabassud. The person thinks that it's only his mother's wealth and she's not going to mind too much, so it's okay for him to take it. What about a father stealing from the wealth of his son? So this is the other way around now. Here the hand of the father will definitely not be cut because the shubuha is the strongest it could possibly be. And it is simply the shubuha of At-Tamalluk. The father has the right to take possession of the wealth of his son. This is pertaining to certain conditions, but this is generally the case, that he can take possession of his son's wealth. The Prophet ﷺ said to one of the companions, Anta wa maluka li abik. You and your wealth belong to your father. In fact, we have two more types of shubuhat. We could use the shubuha of tabassud. The father thinks that the son will not mind if he takes from the son's wealth. After all, the father does have great rights over the son, does he not? And also, the shubuha of infaq. Because if the father is poor, then it is obligatory upon the son, if he has enough money, to spend on the father. So this is another shubuha. So here we have three various shubuhat. In the previous situation, we had two. And so from this, we can have a qaida that the usul and the furu' if they steal from each other, their hands are not cut off. So any child stealing from his father or mother or forefathers and foremothers, then the hand is not cut off. And similarly, going the other way around, the parent stealing from his child or grandchildren going down in that line, the hand is not cut off. What about other close relatives? Here we have a difference of opinion. Some scholars say that similarly the hand is not cut off if somebody steals from his close relative. Other scholars say that in accordance with the generality of the evidence, it is cut off except when the father steals from his child. So based upon this, if a man steals from his brother, then the hand can be cut off. Another opinion says that if the two people would be mahram of each other, if one was a male and the other female, then if one steals from the other, the hand is not cut off. So based upon this then, if a man steals from his brother or sister, the hand is not cut off. If he steals from his nephew or niece, it is not cut off because a man is not allowed to marry his niece. And if a man steals from his uncle, it will not be cut off because a man is not allowed to marry his aunt. However, if a man steals from his cousin, it would be cut off because the cousins are allowed to marry. So we have three different opinions here in total. The first one says that if you steal from your relatives, the hand is cut off except for the father and son relationship, or more specifically the usul and furu. The second opinion says that if a person steals from his relative, the hand is cut off, except with one exception, and that is the father stealing from the son, and not the other way around. And they quote their evidence, the Prophet saying, you and your wealth are for your father. So they say this is the only specific evidence we have to make the exception. So the difference between the first two opinions then is that the first opinion talks about the usul and furu. The second opinion only talks about the father and son relationship. Or we could say the father and his children relationship. And then we have the third opinion, which says that if the two are related by way of a mahram relationship, then the hand is not cut off, but if they are not mahram, if one was a male and the other a female, then the hand is cut off if one steals from the other. If we look at the evidence strictly, then what we have an exception for is the father taking from his children, because here we have an evidence from the text. Apart from that, we don't seem to have any evidence which would justify us not cutting off the hand from the one who steals from his relative. Okay, what about a husband and wife relationship? If a wife steals from the wealth of her husband, here the shubuha is strong because the husband has to spend on the wife. And of course, we have the famous narration which we took where the Prophet allowed Hind to take from the wealth of Abu Sufyan in accordance with what is right and proper. And this would be without Abu Sufyan knowing, of course. But what about the other way around? Well, some scholars have said that even here we have a shubuha, which is to say that the husband knows that men are the guardians and caretakers of women, 
and so therefore the husband has great authority over the wife and because of this authority the husband could help himself to some of the wealth of the wife. Well this argument could stand if it was the case that the wife has left some wealth not in a guarded place. However the problem would be what if the wife puts her wealth in such a place where it is clear that she does not want the husband to take hold of it. Maybe she puts it in a safe with a padlock or a number lock and we have every indication with this that she does not want the husband to take hold of this wealth. If then the husband steals it from this hirz, would the hand be cut off? Well the better opinion here would be yes it would be cut off, there is no shubuha. And that's of course if the wife demands that his hand be cut off. So if the wife takes him to court then she does have the right to have his hand cut off. And this would be in accordance with the weightier opinion. Okay, what about if a servant steals from the wealth of his master? Here the situation is similar to the son stealing from the father because the master is obligated to spend on the servant. So the servant can easily say that the master has to spend on him anyway. And so the servant was simply taking what is his right because the servant does have some right over the wealth of the master in the same way a person has some right over the wealth of his father. So even if this wealth was in a well-guarded place, let's say a safe, and the servant broke in and took some of this wealth, his hand would not be cut off. In the same way the hand of the wife would not be cut off if she broke into the husband's safe and took some wealth. What if the master steals some wealth of the servant? Well here definitely the hand is not cut off because the wealth of the servant is in fact the wealth of the master. What about if a Muslim steals from the Baytul Mal? Then again this is a shubuha because the Muslims have a right to the wealth in the Baytul Mal. So if he is poor then we can understand why he might steal from the Baytul Mal. But what about if he's rich? Well the point is if he is rich it could be that on that particular day he may have turned poor or a rich person could still be needy due to some circumstances which adversely affect his wealth and so he becomes needy. Also it could be that a person is working for the general benefit of the population. For example a person is an imam or he gives the adhan or he's a teacher. So these types of people are allowed to take from the Baytul Mal. Of course it needs to be known that stealing from Baytul Mal is a haram but our concern here is whether the hand is cut off or not. And remember what we said that there must not be any shubuhat. Or for example if a Muslim steals from the ghanima which has not yet been divided up into five parts. The ghanima is divided up into five parts. Four of these parts go to the soldiers who were involved in the war. And one part which is the fifth part is yet further divided up into five parts. The first part is for Allah and the Messenger which means it goes to the Muslim community at large. Then the second one goes to the family of the Prophet The third one goes to the Yatama who are the orphans. Then the fourth one to the Masakin who are the poor people. And the fifth to the Ibn Sabil who is the wayfarer who has been cut off from his homeland and he does not have enough money to get back. And the reason why a Muslim's hand would not be cut off if he steals from this Ghanima is because remember what we said that a fifth of this fifth goes to the general Muslim community at large. Therefore if he steals from this wealth he does have a right to this wealth. Because remember part of this wealth is dedicated for the Muslim community at large. However what about when the wealth is divided up into its five parts? Well this depends. If he takes from the four parts which are given to the fighters and he himself was one of the fighters then his hand is not cut off. And the reason should be obvious because he does have a share in those four parts. So this is a valid shubuha. But if he takes from that portion in which he does not have a right, then his hand is cut off. For example, a person is not an orphan, but he steals from the orphan's portion of that wealth, then yes, his hand can be cut off. But what about if there are two people who share in some wealth, so they're partners in some wealth, and one of them steals from the shared wealth, is his hand cut off? The answer is no, because this is the shubhatul mulk, the doubt concerning the ownership. So if they share in let's say 100 pounds, half each, so it's 50-50 share, and one of the partners steals up to 50 pounds, then his hand will not be cut off, because 50 pounds 
is at least his share, even though he put it in the pot so the total money is shared amongst them. But because he does have a right to half of this money at least, then his hand would not be cut off, even though it's not permissible for him to steal, because the money is shared wealth. So it's not like he is the sole proprietor of this wealth. Okay, so what about this situation? We'll combine two scenarios in one. Firstly, we know that if a son steals from the father, his hand is not cut off, and that's according to one opinion, of course. And we also know that if a man steals from a shared wealth, which is shared between him and his partner, then his hand is not cut off. Well, what about if a person steals from the wealth of his father, which is shared? So his father has a partner in business and he shares wealth with this partner. Now the son of this father comes along and takes from this shared wealth. Is his hand cut off? The answer is no, because in the two individual scenarios, the hand is not cut off. So if you combine the two scenarios, the hand also is not cut off because of this shubuha. So in other words, we are combining the two shubuhat together, the shubhatul mulk and the shubhatul infaq. How is the had punishment established? Well, it is established by two just men witnesses, or it could be established by a confession. And we have an evidence of confession also coming up. But with a confession, do you have to repeat it? So he confesses twice. So this would take the place of the two witnesses. The answer is no. Just like in the case of Zina, we say the better opinion is that the person does not have to repeat the confession to a total of four times. Can the testimony of women be accepted in cases of stealing? The answer is no. So you cannot say that you'll bring two men witnesses, or if not, you'll bring one man and two women witnesses. No, this cannot be accepted. In had punishments, the testimony of women is not accepted. And testifying against yourself is something legislated. Allah Jalla wa Ala says, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, kunu qawwa mina bil qisti, shuhada ilillahi walaw ala amfusikum. O you who believe, stand up for justice as witnesses for Allah, even if it be against your own selves. Also, we say just as we said in the case of zina, if somebody confesses against himself and then afterwards he retracts his confession, this is not accepted. And this is in accordance with the correct opinion and we discussed this issue before. Is it a condition that the victim of the theft demands his money back from the thief for the thief's hand to be cut off? Some scholars have said, yes, this is one of the conditions. And they take their evidence from a narration which is coming up in which Safwan ibn Umayyah, his wealth was stolen by somebody. He was sleeping on his rida and somebody came and took this rida from underneath his head. He was using the rida as a pillow. And so Safwan ibn Umayyah took the perpetrator to the Prophet. And then afterwards, when he realized that the thief will have his hand cut off, he interceded and he said, I give him my rida as a gift. And the Prophet said, Why did you not let him off before you brought him to me? So they say this proves that if the victim does not demand his wealth back before the matter is taken to court and before it is established that the perpetrator did in fact steal, then the hand is not cut off. However, we find that this hadith is not in accordance with the ruling which they give. Rather, we say, if it is established that this person did in fact steal, then his hand is to be cut off, whether the victim of the theft demands his money back or not. What the hadith is in fact saying is that if you wanted this man's hand to remain intact, you should not have brought him to me. This is the meaning of the hadith. It does not mean to say that if the victim does not demand his money back, then the hand would not be cut off. So the point is that there's a difference between the two scenarios. It could well be that the theft is established and the perpetrator is proved to be guilty. And all the while, the victim of the theft does not demand his wealth back. But we still cut off the thief's hand. Why? Because the theft has been established. And this is the opinion of Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He says that it is not a condition for the hand to be cut off, that the victim of the theft demands his money back. And if the hand is to be cut off, then what hand is cut off? The right hand is cut off from the wrist. In accordance with the statement of Allah, 
والسارق والسارقة فقطعوا أيديهما. The male and female thief cut off their hands. And the hand is up to the wrist, unless otherwise stated. For example, in the ayah of the wudu, the hand goes up to the elbows. The ayah does not tell us which hand is cut off, but the ulama say that the right hand is cut off. After the hand is cut off, then you must stop the bleeding. So however this is done, then it would be done. Typically, they would put it in boiling oil. Why is the hand cut off? Because predominantly you steal with the hand. Yes, it's true, you could steal with other parts of the body, or you could steal in a way which does not involve the hand, but because the hand is predominantly the tool for stealing, it is the hand which is cut off. If he repeats the act of theft, then some ulama have said that the second time his left foot is to be cut off, up to the ankle bone, then the third time his left hand is cut off, and then the fourth time his right foot is cut off. But there doesn't seem to be any evidence for this. So therefore the other opinion is that if he repeats the theft, he is simply to be imprisoned, or other such corrective measures can be taken, but no other limb is cut off. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. We mentioned seven conditions for the cutting off. State them, and then also state how the sariqa of the theft can be established in the court. Question number two. If a man kidnaps a child who is wearing some expensive jewellery, which is at least a quarter of a dinar in value, then is the hand of the abductor cut off? Give the detail in this scenario. Question number Give the detail about the ghazi or the soldier stealing from the war booty. So talk about before it is divided and after it is divided. 